And, and I also did take a little bit of film class in journalism school, but right. we learned how to uh, cut tape with or cut and use the red tape and all that <laughs> stuff. So it was right. a little so before this. What he's saying is that even though he went to film school, he also would not be able to work. OBS. There you go. Right. Right. It takes it takes a non film person like him. Right. To be able to actually get it to work. I'm the savior. Yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> So I want to I want to get into this whole thing and I want to be able to uh, preface uh, some of the things that we started to talk about yesterday and I thought were really good. And then we realized that we were not actually putting a podcast out. <laughs> so, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> let's 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 go right into it. Right. David, right. you have been with Grassroots magazine for 27 is, uh, years yes uh as we discussed well yesterday <laughs> we'll pretend today is yesterday i got an email from an old friend yesterday hey congratulations on 27 years at grassroots and i said oh something must have appeared on linkedin because i don't even know you know what day it is i mean you get to a certain age you yep. forget like when your birthday is and important yep. stuff like that so yeah so 27 years full-time um i freelanced before that for about two years basically started when I got out of school and, um, you know, I lived, uh, went to school in Athens, Georgia, UGA, lived in Atlanta. So I had wrote Atlanta basically right there. So um, sort of freelancing for um, for grassroots back then. And that's when, um, you know, the runoffs were, were at Road Atlanta. So right. that was a huge deal. I, I think that it's important because we started to say this yesterday, but I think it's important that we don't glaze over that 27 year number. Right. And I'm not, listen, David, I'm not trying to make it seem yeah, like, you know, but there's an important fact here. Yeah. Uh, 27 years ago, where were some of you 27 years ago? Well, I had said yesterday, well, and know. unfortunately I'll repeat myself that yeah. I was eight years old. Right. Yeah. So we know Jared again has was eight years old, but the point that I'm trying to establish is there have been many uh, famous car people, car celebrities, YouTube personalities. You know the guys from Hoonigan. You know the guy from Donut. The guys from Donut. But here's my point: uh, not devaluing anything that they are or they do. There were people in this industry that paved the way for it to be the way it is. Yeah. And grassroots, you were part of that culture that allowed that to come to the forefront. Right. And, and, it, and you're right. I, I, I am old. Um, it, it is. <laughs> and, and it's been interesting looking back because you're right. Like um, the cars we're writing about now that are like, oh, they're older, they're classics those were cars we had new. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I went and test drove an EG Civic SI uh, to buy one as a new car. Um, I wound up buying uh, a Sentra SCR instead, but I did wind up owning an EG several years ago. So it is interesting to have that perspective. Like, you know, we drove Type R's when they were new. We um, CRX's, GTI's, all those cars mm -hmm. when they were new or, 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 or cars you can get really easy back when, you know, E30 BMWs, were, were freebies and now you know an e30 is is worth some money yeah mm -hmm. so it's been interesting I, I, I remember seeing the um the miata at the new york auto show which i believe it debuted at chicago but you know so i'm from new home for i guess spring break when it's the new york auto show would have been like i guess 89 i'm totally guessing but there was this new car called the miata and it's like oh that's interesting um fast forward and now hindsight being 2020 you look how the miata has been such a huge part of our world it's the answer to every question. Uh, there's one in my garage over here I've owned for uh, 23 years. So it's like, it is interesting. It's not like, oh, I read about when the Miata was new and what it meant. It's like, no, we were there. And and uh, actually good friends of my parents, they had a early first year Miata. And it was like, oh, they had one. And I remember seeing them drive by once. And it was like, oh, that's like, that was new. It wasn't like, oh, they're all old and, and worn out. It was so new so it is interesting seeing us kind of revisit a lot of this stuff even though we were there the first time yeah, um these are the jdm japanese classics that now are starting to fetch 
un surmountables amount of cash oh yeah oh my god and yeah i i mean i saw i think on craigslist the other day i feel like i saw a miata with five figures worth of miles for like 15 grand like yeah they're, they're they're going up now it's wild but and it's interesting like i was actually looking or i guess still i'm looking for a wishbone honda civic and um my wife and i we've had a bunch we've um some we bought new, some we bought used. We had a 2000 Civic Si in Electron Blue with actually we had Koenig burners on it to, to show how uh, old school we were. And we bought that car brand new, right? And we've had CRXs and other Civics. And back then, you know, I was thinking recently, it's like, well, I bought, I think, one of my CRXs, you know, B16A swap, all done, beautiful. And it was like 3200 bucks. And it was, I forget even, maybe it was Craigslist. I don't even remember. But it was like, oh, there it is. You know, I'm, I want to buy a car today. Let's go look at it and let's buy it. Uh, our EG Civic. Hey, let's go buy it. And you went and bought it. Now those cars, you can't find them. Or, or right. if you can, you know, they're gross or they're or they're money. Um, I saw on Craigslist someone down here selling an EG uh, DX or VX in the right color in that blue, very very clean, and it was like eighty five hundred bucks. Mm. Asking, and it's like, God, remember when like. You can just wake up and say, I want to buy an EG Civic Si. Okay, that's 3400 bucks. All right, let's go find one in Orlando. You know, we're not, we're not talking about shipping it from around the country. We're talking like, let's go buy it and then we'll get lunch. Yeah. Well, so you have, I mean, you're naming obviously some of the cars that I think are probably the most relatable with your reader base yeah. and in and, and our demo because right. they are affordable cars that you yeah. can get in. And go the same day to an autocross and and be able to maneuver around and still have a good time. But we're seeing cars that you know you guys reviewed brand new out of the Dying. box SW twenty, you know MR twos and RX sevens and all these cars that now. I mean, I would just say are on another level. Yeah. And, and it's weird, I don't know if weird is the right word, to go back and like look at what I wrote or what we wrote about these cars when they were new. It's like, oh, what I say about that car? And, you know, we have the files and, you know, it's like, and, and I've kind of joked, like, is it plagiarism if I use my words again 20 years later? <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and it does feel weird. Or even like photos, like, um, you know, uh, we went digital 20 years ago so I can access that stuff or uh, well, 21 years ago. And it's interesting to access those files. And then you look at the file date and it's like, Oh my God, I shot that photo, you know, 2003. Right. Yeah. Early days of import drag racing. We, we were down there when, um, in South Florida. So you're right. A lot of these cars that were big back then, they're still kind of experiencing a resurgence. And part of it, I think, cause they were just really good cars. They were, computer controlled but not overly complicated so they were still kind of analogy they were the right size they were the right weight they they are they were fast but not crazy fast i mean let's be honest like a new gtr which i guess isn't that new is a cool car but i don't know if i want to go i don't you know 186 miles an hour without a roll cage at daytona you know so some of these cars almost make more sense because they're in a the right uh speed you know we're comfortable with them and you can fix them and you're right the aftermarket's huge um so yeah we've we'll watched these cars do this bell curve like you know 92 civic si okay i mean i test drove one new owned one when they were easy to get as a used car built it up as an autocross car whatever sold it now i wouldn't mind buying one again yeah can't even find one yeah i I was a, I was really attracted to DSMs, yeah. you know, in in my day. <laughs> in your heyday. But but here's Sorry. the thing, I I'll tell you an interesting angle, an interesting experience I had. I recently had the opportunity to have a shot at owning, uh, I don't want to say a clean car. Like if I could get some of my old cars back, that would be great. But I can't, mm. and the car that I drove was probably the cleanest that I could find right. without spending like everything I have, right? Right, right. 
So, because those outlier cars now, you know, they're t- way too much money. So, right. I find one of these cars. I get in it. It has all that reminiscent nostalgia sound and feels. And, you, you know, you're sitting in it and you vaguely have that muscle memory of this is yeah. how I used to sit. This is what I used to do with my hands. This is what it used to sound like. And then you drive it and remember all the things that you had blacked out about. Yeah, you, 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 sometimes you can't go home again. And <laughs> right, I admit that happened many years ago. I had a um, I had a Rabbit GTI yep. again back when they were free. I probably spent a thousand bucks on it. <laughs> right. You know, built it up, did it. We did it as a magazine car, and it was a good one. Sold it. Had a chance to drive one. This is actually many, a few years later, but now it is, we're talking many years ago, built up by the right shop. Oh, it's got the right gearbox. It's got the right everything. Mm-hmm. And by the time I got the second gear, I'm like, eh, maybe this isn't right for me anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it does happen. But sometimes you do get at them. And no, just, you know, the, I don't want the GTI guys coming after me. It was just a funny feeling. And it can go both ways. It is nice when you get in something that's old. It's like your favorite jeans. My Miata, um, I'm a horrible owner. I let it sit for eight years. Um, only got it going out, going again uh, around Christmas time. Um, took it to a shop in town that does spec Miatas. Um, all it really needed to do was like drain the fuel, and that was it. But I'm an idiot. And also, I don't want to drain fuel in my garage because then you got to jack it up. What you know, I don't have a lift. But anyway, driving it, it's like, oh. This still is really awesome. Yeah. And, and mine makes, it's got a built motor, it's still a 1.6, blah, blah, blah. I saw the dyno sheets from 20 years ago. Our buddy, Ed Stemp, tuned it, who does, he's gone on to do Le Mans, Daytona, everything. I make like 112 horsepower at the wheels. You know, that's nothing. But it still feels awesome. So, yeah. you know, well, if we drove places, I would drive it. But in today's world, we... We don't go anywhere anymore. But, the, Miata, um, the Miata wasn't a heavy car. It, right. Uh, it felt torquey for what it was. It had good gearing, and that right. was a huge part of it. Yeah. And it was a car that if you got to an autocross, you could have a lot of fun with because of its nature to be able to drive it flat out with yeah. no lifting. Right. And, and that's the thing. It's a, it, it ticked all the boxes, and that there's a reason even today – I mean, you go, you know, and everyone's, a lot of people are still into them. They, they work. And plus they were, and then add in the fact they were very durable cars. They were well built. Um, you know, they had a, so much good stuff going for them. Um, we're friends with Norman Garrett, who was one of the original designers. And I've known him since longer than I've been at the magazine, right? And it's funny talking to him, like all the stuff he did. And now to look at it, like, oh, it worked. Like, hmm. you know, like, oh, yeah, we did that for this reason back in when they designed the car in the eighties. Well, yeah. here we are today and it worked. It held, yay, you did it. And, and I'm not an engineer, so, but it's cool. And that's one of those cars, like, I mean, my brother has a Miata. Our parents have a Miata. <laughs> All of our readers have Miatas. Um, I don't even know how many we have technically in the fleet at the office. I, I don't know. And I don't, don't ask me how many have gone through our hands. Yeah. Um, and they're fun. Anyway, right, like my Miata, it, it's slow, but also means I can kind of wail on it a little bit, and I'm going 60 miles an hour. Yeah, <laughs> which is nice. You know, I, we have speed limits, police, people. You know, I don't live on a racetrack, so mm-hmm. it's been a good car. Um, but that's a car. Yeah, going back, I remember when they were new, and it, it, you know, of course, I there's no way I could have afforded one. Like only the you had to be a, a super beyond cool kid to have one. Yeah, and. I had sneakers, you know, so. No, I, 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 I get it. I think yeah. what's interesting in that time period and why these cars are becoming uh, our generation of classic cars yeah, is because of the fact that when you really start to think about it, that was the vintage that had the perfect balance between analog and digital. Yeah. It was that sweet spot of rawness with comfort, with with just starting to get into some comfort creatures, right? Creature totally, comfort. and I, yeah. I, I would agree, and that's that is part of it. Yes, we 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 were past car. I mean, and and 
my other hat, my morning hat, I'm also editor of Classic Motorsports. So I, I work, right. you know, I look, I do with both. I've owned both cars. Um, by the, let's say the early 90s, we had gone past, you know, we had carburetors. We had gone past the first days of fuel injection, which were a little rocky. We had got, by the 90s, we had gone past, and even the 80s, we've gone past like CIS injection, which was a good, you know, intermediate step. So right. now we actually have like real computer controlled, fuel injection so the cars are very drivable yep and you could modify them that's right and you're right it was a total sweet spot and the cars weren't too heavy and then add in the fact that the hondas had double wishbone suspension which you know on paper you know right there you're starting with something really good when you yep. lower it, it, it you could lower it and it got even better mm. um you could swap engines and do stuff you could put you know i remember the first time it was like Actually, we did one. We had an 86 Civic at the magazine, and Tim put a, um Integra engine in. So it's – and that was like a huge deal. Right. And then soon after – and it it kind of bolted in. And then soon after, we had all the – you know, that stuff all blew up. And it's like, oh, you can take an Integra, you know, B18 and put it in your your, your 80, 88 Civic. And now you've made something that's, you know, one plus one equals three. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's so funny because when you start to look at these cars, like you said before, you were starting to have the best of both worlds. You had yeah. cars that you could uh, – that had fuel injection, had the ability to tune, but didn't have the computer-rated restrictions that these OEs started to apply to ECUs as things got more complicated. And I remember, I mean, a big deal was OBD2, which uh, I remember we, our first car uh, we had a, that had, we had a um, BMW 318Ti, this okay. is 96, loaned to us from BMW. Okay. And they let us make it into a race car. We made it into a road race car. It was with BMW CCA. And um, I remember when we first tar- started playing with it on the dyno, nothing made more power. And that's when we had to learn about OBD2. And I will say, we're like, oh my God, the sky's falling end of the game well now we know we've cracked that and we can we can ship you know we could do stuff with those cars um and now it's funny to look at a, a 318 ti like when's the last time you saw one in real life right. right and and back then we had a brand new one full race car living at my house so it is interesting again how you you go full circle um and you know now if you have one it's 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 radwood approved mm-hmm. Well, there that's interesting. Oh well, yeah, right, right talk, to Radwood. I was gonna say. Talk, I know. Jared talk. just brought this up yesterday. Yeah, d- apparently Scott's the odd man out here. He was. Uh, David yeah. was talking to Bradley from Bradley, yeah. right from Radwood. Yeah. Yesterday, yeah. this is this is very much a thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was that was one of my questions. Was uh, you know you obviously have a lot of experience with Japanese and Euro classics from the eighties and nineties. How, if at all? Are car shows like Radwood impacting the classic '80s and '90s car markets in your? Opinion? I think. Oh, I think it's. Um, it is nice to see those cars get attention. It's also affected values, I think. Um, but that goes back to another truism that we've always seen: you want the car you couldn't afford when you were in high school or college, and that goes back to our parents, right? Or and and even you know. You know, if you grew up in the 60s, what did you want? You wanted a Hemi Cuda. You wanted a Corvette. You wanted a GTO. Yep. You couldn't afford it. You had a Rambler, right? So, you know, when those people were old enough, they went back and bought Hemi Cudas and all that stuff. And you look at the prices and you go back uh, 10, 15 years and, you know, a Hemi Cuda was worth a ton of money. Um, Golden Mercedes, all that stuff. Some of that stuff has cooled. Some of the muscle cars have, have cooled off. Um, so now you look at people my age, your age, our age, yeah. and you want what you couldn't afford in school, right? I wanted a, a Type R, me. I wanted a Type R Integra. I wanted a Miata. I wanted a, an SVO Mustang. I wanted, you know, um, there was a girl at my school. She had a Mc, ASC McLaren. Remember the, oh, yeah. um, one of the Mustangs, right? So super rare. Oh, super rare. And, and I, I can picture, I, I, I was not cool enough to know her, but <laughs> now like that, oh, I want one. So now you can buy it. And and those cars have gotten more expensive. For a little while, they were not, right? You could buy a, you know. And and all used cars have gotten more expensive in general in the past, you know, whatever year or so. Yeah. But again, you go back and get what you want. Um, 
I personally I screwed up in that I already bought the Miata way long ago. I bought the Civic Si way long ago. Um, I, ha- I wanted an air cooled Porsche. We've owned one. My wife and I we've had one for I don't even know how long. We bought it before they got expensive. We've owned it probably 13, 14 years. Um, but if I didn't, and I had the space, I'd be thinking, oh man, you know, E30 M3, right? That was a car I wanted. Had a chance to buy one that wasn't right, didn't buy it, but I have an E46 M3. So I wound up getting that instead, hmm. which again was a car I drove it when new and they were cool. And I bought it the day before Haggerty released their top 10 list with E46 M3 at the top. I literally bought my car the day before. Oh, geez. So I got it for a killer deal. And then it became a big deal. I was like, ah, oh, cool. All right. You know, I got it. Um, E46 M3 is one of my favorite vintages. It, oh, it's, I, it's cool. It's it's that perfect dose of styling. You know, they had the louvers on the fenders. Yeah. And, and it, it kind of walks itself between that transition from – some of the you know i think that some of the more modern m3s when we get into like the e92 stuff whatever like it gets a little watered down they went back to the sedan the sedan in a part and it just doesn't feel the same yeah it's i mean again that was it's scary to think that car you know is an e46 is over 20 years old these days right yeah. So again, that's not, we think, oh, it's kind of new, but it's, it's kind of not new by today's standards. Um, but I was saying, yes, you you go back, you want the stuff you couldn't afford as a, when you were younger. And I think with Radwood, we're seeing that, um, it also seems, and I don't know if Concord 11's helped this, but like now some of the nerdy stuff is cool, right? It's cool to be a nerd maybe. So like, um, we had up until recently, we just sold it. We had a, a 75 Pontiac Catalina Safari. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 19 feet of wagon, um, found it in Orlando, all original. We were the second owners, bone stock, right? I wanted a sled in high school. You would never want to drive no. a station wagon. <laughs> that was like the worst, right? But now we would take that thing anywhere and people would flip out. I mean, you could take it to the supermarket and I'd get people coming up. Oh, can I? You know, can I check it out? We had a wagon like that when back when we had the kids. Can I look at it? It's like, of course you can look at it. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy that you're excited about cars. And and people like would flip out over it. And I'm like, you know, we have a Porsche. No, they don't care. They cared about the wagon. And and so there's a little bit of that too. Again, it's going back to nostalgia. You wanted either what you couldn't afford or what brings back good memories. And and so going full circle with Radwood, I think we're seeing some of that. We're seeing a lot of that. And then you add in the fact um, cars not sold here that are uh, 25 years old or older can be legally imported. Yeah. So, um, in fact, I just interviewed this morning Mr. Duncan, Duncan Imports, who has like hundreds of these things in stock. So now we have all the cars that we wanted in Gran Turismo, right? We all played mm-hmm. Gran Turismo. So what are you playing Gran Turismo? You had a, a, a CRX SIR. You had a... Um, uh, a Nissan Primera, you had a Mazda Dimeo, you had a, you know, or you had a, a Miata, but it was the type whatever. The Unos, yeah. Unos. And now it's like, oh, now those cars are legal. So you add in that fact, it's like, oh, now I can get not just a Miata, I can get a right-hand drive Miata. Is it better? Yes, yeah, right-hand drive. <laughs> okay. You know, it doesn't matter, right? So you have that added in, that it's a little extra benefit that you can bring those cars here legally and there's ways to insure, you know, obviously you can insure them and all that. And they're here legally and you're not going to get, you know, if you remember the early days when they were importing the Skylines and they were all know. getting seized up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You don't want that. But now I know I can go, I can buy a JDM, whatever, a Civic, uh, an Integra, a Crown, uh, you know, um, you know, an Escargo, whatever. So that's the other thing I think is added in is like you have all the cars from your youth and then we have all the cars that we dreamed about, but we couldn't have. All the forbidden fruit is now legal and here. And that just makes it even like a double explosion. Like, I, you know, I'd love a Suzuki Cappuccino. Oh, I was, I was waiting for you to say that. I have one. It's on the shelf. I could get it. For you. <laughs> um, well, you know, so but I, I, I just want to take, uh, like a little segue off of this because I was actually having a debate a couple weeks ago with a friend of mine and you know this is sort of on topic for what we were just talking about but like 
I wonder now with the advent of how relatively easy it is to get cars imported that are 25 years or older, like I was having a debate as to whether or not you get the USDM version of something or not. So like, what do I mean? I, I the, mean, I the, get where the, you're the Mark IV Supra, for example. <laughs> like, for me personally, I would think that if it's a vehicle that originated and was born in Japan, I'd much, I'd much rather have that one. But my friend, right. the, value, the values go the other way, though. I know, I know, which is which is what makes it confusing. But like, I was having right. this debate with a friend of mine and who used to have a USDM Type R. And it's like, well, now you can import the, the, the yeah. Japanese one. So I'd much rather have that one. And we were just kind of going back and forth and, and riffing off of that. I think it depends. Like, you're right. Like, the Japanese one is cool. Like, um, somewhere I forgot recently, so I saw um, the British Racing Green Miata, right-hand drive. And it's like, oh, man, do I sell mine and buy that, right? It's a lateral right. move, right? right? But then it's like, well, I've owned this one for so long. You know, it's original paint, never been hit. Still has the original top on it, right? So it, I know, like, I wouldn't want to make that move. If mine got stolen tonight, mm. yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably buy a Japanese one because I'm a nerd. Then again, you get the reality of do you want to drive a right hand drive car in the U.S. Mm. Um, my wife and I used to own a, we had a classic Mini, but we had an Innocenti, which is the Italian built version. We had an Innocenti Mini Cooper, and it was left hand drive, locked into it. And you know what? It was cool. It was actually you could drive like a normal car. You never had to think, oh, I got to shift with my 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 left hand. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, it's like, well, it's novel, and I've driven right hand drive stuff. But you're like, well, sometimes it is nice that a car is just like a car. But I do hear you. I probably I think the the Japanese version would be cool. And again, that just is something that didn't exist. And um, you know, up until COVID, it was pretty easy to import cars. We've written about this more for classic, but. You know, there are companies that specialize in putting cars on ships. Yeah. Um, or you can put them in a plane. And I remember talking to friends of ours, this is just before pre COVID, they had just bought a new race car, um, a GT3 car, you know, came out of, they bought it from the factory in, in Europe. Mm. And like, like, oh yeah, it, it, um, it went on the plane Wednesday and it was in Orlando Thursday, you know, like going through customs. Like, and it's not, and it's not that much more money. And, and, he told me what the price was, and I don't want to say because I'll forget, but whatever he paid for to fly the car from Europe, he's like, if I had trucked the car from California to here, we were at Daytona, it would have been more or about the same. And it, it's like, and the insurance, you know, you don't have to worry about the car being at sea and falling, the container falling off. You know, you don't have to have the insurance for as long. But his point was bringing cars from Europe to here is not that big a deal anymore. It's like... You know, let's say it was three grand, maybe it was five grand, but on a hundred and something, you know, two hundred thousand dollar car, it, it wasn't that big a deal. And granted, it was a different level than buying CRXs, but the fact was, like, the car was here in like a day or two, and we went and picked it up at the airport, and now it's here at the racetrack. And the world has gotten so small that was never, you never would have thought about doing that 10, 20 years ago. You know, oh, I'll buy a car from Europe and it'll be here on Thursday. No. <laughs> And it's hard because now we're dealing with a lot of the COVID stuff, which has right. completely decimated shipping lines and things yeah. like that, made it very difficult. Uh, I think when you start to think about importing cars, it's strange. Over there, they may want our cars. Over here, right. we always want <laughs> yes. something that we can't have. Yep. You know? Totally. Uh, you know, I used to go to Tokyo Auto Salon. Yep. I uh, haven't been in a couple of years. And several, many years ago, some dude grabbed me. He saw the, he saw the logo on the shirt. He, he knew us, Grassroots Motorsports. And he spoke, he, spoke, he spoke English. And we were chatting, and he gave me his card. And I may have it somewhere in this mess. It's my office. But his card, it said, like, um, USDM imports and equipment. And I'm like, dude, we should both just trade turn signals. Like, we should both go to, our, <laughs> go to the local u Pullets and I'll just trade you USDM turn yeah. signals and taillights for your JDM turn signals and trail, taillights. <laughs> right. And that'll be our business because you always want what you can't get. Yeah. Uh, someone should write a song about that, you, you know. And and that's the thing. Like, and we're so. I don't know what the word is or the reason, but you always you want you're what always you that can't way. Have. And with yeah. and with car stuff, it's like, oh, I got the American taillights, but boy, if my DSM had Japanese spec taillights, that would make it cooler. 
This was is, it faster? No. This is the thing that has been killing me about the entire Euro movement for <laughs> decades. Yeah. You can walk up – if you're not an informed Euro guy, you can walk up to a Mark VI GTI. To the average person, looks bone stock. You look right. at their list of mods – Seven pages long. Oh, God. Every right, here we go. Europe, European spec <laughs> blinker switch, European spec, you know. Is but, doubt listening? <laughs> this is, well, listen, I'm just saying. So I think the hardest part is for me, that's right, I'm going to cry a sob story that everybody that watches our podcast knows. I finally got to a point in my life where I, as of a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I could possibly get myself a GTR. Now, not a new GTR. I Sorry. wanted I, – I don't like R32s. I, no, I, I like them, but I'm, that's not what I want. Um, right. I can't afford an R34. So naturally, smack dab in the middle, I have talked myself into wanting an R33 GTR. I start looking for them. I decide that if I'm going to do this once – I'm going to look for the car I want. So I turned down two or three of them. Nope. I'm not going to spend that much money on that car. Little did I know that I was months away from the precipice of the world destroying itself and (laughs) the values would go up by 40% and you can't even get them anymore. So now I'll never own one. (laughs) I know. And and that was reiterated this morning. The interview this morning, he's like, "Yeah, I'm paying more." And that's ever like, yeah. used cars everywhere seems to have just gone nuts. But yes. and I know there's, there's reasons, but um, yeah, timing sucks. Uh, it sucked for you. It was good for me when I bought my car. So and that's part of it. Um, <laughs> you son of a. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like it's like anything, right? It's like buying real estate or or, or yeah. securities or or yeah. you know, guitars, right? Timing is every. What's the most important part of of comedy, right? Timing. Yeah. So um. But there's always stuff like so I didn't get a, a, a GTR, but I was looking like like a Toyota Crown, like that would be badass. Yeah. And that's Ooh. like ten grand, which ten grand is still a lot of money, but like I don't know, like or going back a cappuccino is 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 ten or twelve, um, but the Nissan Cedric, some some of the other stuff like yeah is still really really cool, mm-hmm. and it's the more esoteric stuff maybe. Like everyone knows the AZ one. Or, or you know, a Civic Type R. Yep. But it's like, wow, oh, you got a crown. Oh, you, you're, you're. That's like a deep cut. Like, you know, like you're into B sides. That, yeah. you know, that's cool. So, and I think it's like before this, there were a lot of cool cars that you can get your hands on for pennies out of Japan if you wanted to bring oh, yeah. something over. Chasers, you know, with all the JZX stuff. I mean, yeah. you you had generations there of cars that we didn't get that came with turbo engines and easy to tune cars and interswappable, you know, parts and bits and pieces. The problem is now there is a bubble. Uh, you know, I keep I keep hearing people say when the bubble bursts. Yeah. I'll tell you something though. I think that on some cars you're going to see a bubble burst, right? I think as cool as they are, I think chasers crowns some of these other japanese cars that really didn't have a namesake they'll go down because people are buying stuff just because they want jdm stuff right now right but uh gtrs i don't i don't think we're yeah. gonna see them go down and they probably won't because that is the that's a halo car right yeah. i mean that's the one everyone knows you know you name uh, yes you know an enthusiast quick name it name a you know a, a JDM car. car yeah okay gtr that's you know that's a big deal um but there's other stuff, you know, Mazda Cosmo. There's always cool stuff. Yeah. And it's, you know, again, it's it's free to look. It's fun to look. Um, it's dangerous again, to look. It is. Well, what saves me is the garage is full. So, and I can't put a lift. I, I did the measurements. I thought I could do a lift. And then I did the measurements and it's like, oh, no, our, our garage is short. So um, it has beautiful plaster work. Whoever built this house, like, they, I mean, they spent some money. This is also 40 years ago, but the garage could have been like, they could have gone two feet higher than I could have put a, a, a lift in. So we're full, but there's tons of cool stuff that would be, you know, fun to drive and own and different. And, um, 
again, this is stuff we didn't have. I mean, 10 years ago, we would not have been having this conversation of, hey, yeah. you want to buy a cool car from Japan? It's like, well, first off, you'd have to be looking 10 years old earlier. Yeah. And like, all right, where are you going to buy it? Oh, I think I found one on eBay, you know. Um, <laughs> or you'd find a car that was converted. I remember looking at a, um, an Integra, be a second gen Integra that had been, the front clip had been swapped to be a right hand drive car. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. I didn't buy it. Who knows what kind of horrors? It may have been perfect. It may have been a horror story. I don't know. Well, yeah. But, you know, I thought it was cool. And, you know, then that wound up not buying it. I was going to buy it for, like, you know, a track car. Um, but it is cool we have all these choices. You know, the world keeps getting smaller. I know I sound like our parents saying that. But um, <laughs> you can – there's so much cool stuff. It's like, you know, whatever number – if I handed you a stack of, of cash, no matter what it is, you'd find something, Right. You know, here you got three grand. Okay, I'll find a cool car for three grand or two grand or 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 fifty grand. Yeah. You know. Um it may not be a GTR. And that's the thing too, like and we've seen this so much with, with in the classic world. If you're saying I have to buy a GTR it has to be an R thirty three, this color and this option. Okay, now you made your universe that small. Of course. And if you're like, I want a cool car that's JDM. Okay, now you got like a zillion to choose from. That's how we found our wagon. I was just looking for a car. Literally, it had to be automatic on the column, uh, chrome bumpers, and bench seats. That's all I wanted. <laughs> okay. And I lucked into this per the perfect year, perfect condition. It was on Craigslist. You know, it wasn't anything. You know, it was an estate sale. Yeah, you'd you'd be surprised how many people are starting to do that. I actually have a buddy of mine who's 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 doing the same thing. He has. A uh, few houses down in Florida, and he wants to have uh, a commuter down there. Yeah. And he's thinking, "Oh, do I, you know, get a Chaser? What about an Aristo? Yeah, you know, or an Altezo, or and, I, you know, it's, I don't know. Neither's a wrong answer. That's the thing. It's like yeah, it's cooler right. than, you know, some boring car. Right. Yeah. I mean, with the exception that, to me, there are some cars when you're getting a car. Just for the sake of having something right hand drive, right? I struggle a little bit when you're getting some of the cars that came with all the bits and bobs that were way better over there. Now I'm on, yeah. It. Now I'm on, yeah. It. Okay, I, no, I hear you, yeah. I, I like to say there's no wrong answer, yeah. Um, it's fun to look and dream and figure out, all right, what would I buy if I had to buy something today? What about tomorrow, you know. <laughs> Well, that's where I get in trouble right about 12.30 at night. It's called Amazon. Right. And yeah, I always, well, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> my wife, every time a package comes to my door, she's like, what did you buy now? And I'm like, honestly, yeah. I don't even remember. I was sleeping. <laughs> and then yeah. out of nowhere, like yesterday's surprise was I've just I've been TIG welding a lot. And right. yesterday's yeah. surprise was I got a whole bunch of different size consumables. Um, which would have been great, except uh, I now had to buy a few different torches because I couldn't get the sizes right at all. I just started ordering <laughs> stuff. But whatever. It is. And, 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 you know, we live in a world where we could do that. Back in the day, you didn't. You had to find it. You had to call someone. You had yeah. to pick up a telephone or visit a dealer. You know, we had to um, collect a car dealers or whatever. And now, you know, click, click, click. And next thing you know, you got to um, – you know, it could be, you know, a new pair of glasses. It could be, you know, uh, a computer or a camera, a car, you know, and it shows up and, 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 and uh, things have become David, way easier to spend our money. Do you remember on the southern state? Because hold on a second. I'm going to take you back. You're going to remember okay. this. I know you will. You got On the southern state parkway, uh, there was a spot by the police barracks where they actually had those – like pull offs, and they were just lines of uh payphones, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like yeah. I always think when I when I drive by that area and I see the runoffs, but there's no phones there anymore, oh. right? <laughs> that, like, that's what life was like, you yeah. Know, people, yeah, if you yeah. wanted to make a phone call, first you had to have change in your pocket, then yeah. you had it to remember the number that you wanted yeah. to call. Yeah. And you had to pull up drive stool style, drive through style, yes. get the phone, dial the number, and be quick about it because your change was going to run up. Yeah. It, it, you know, kids today, 
You're right. I mean, it used to be. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's like collecting stuff today, it's yeah. still a challenge, but, you know. Way easier. You know, it's easier. I mean, I have, you know, my guitar collection scattered about here. There's some guitars I would like to still own, certain yeah. models and colors. I could buy one today. I could literally, there are websites I could go and I could buy it today. And that's too easy. And it's like, so I don't have them because it's like, well, I can go buy it now. It's like, well, that's not fun. But you want to find my... it at a garage sale. You yeah, want to find it like right. out there. The thrill of the chase. Or my, we have a great shop here in town and I'll wait for him to get one. He knows what I like. <laughs> um, you know, I walked in. This is several, This is pre-COVID. I walked in. He goes, hey, your new amp's here. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I just got this in. This is what you want, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, I do want that, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's like that's more fun than having gone online, you know. So it is the thrill to chase. Um, but, yeah, we've made it easier where, you know, if you want some widget or a cool Hot Wheel car or a die-cast car, you just hop on and you can find it. Um, so speaking eh. of easier. Yeah. Uh, COVID brought uh, a lot of interesting changes and lifestyle adjustments, yeah. if you will. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on COVID. We've done right. that. Uh, yeah. But what I do want to do is I want to highlight some difficulties as an editor that I could yeah. see. So you're an editor of a magazine, two magazines, right. yeah. where – they actually spend a good amount of coverage and time on events and yeah. a year and a half, nothing. Right. And yes. Yeah, so it's been interesting. So just, so, um, I oversee, but you know, I'm responsible for both of our magazines, grassroots motorsports and classic motorsports, as well as all the social media for both those and the websites. So if, and, and our YouTube. So if you, you know, that's it's, it. That's it. And, and <laughs> special projects. Um, so uh, you got to oversee. So it's a lot of stuff to oversee and, um, COVID happened and yeah. like everyone, we didn't know what was happening. In fact, I was supposed to be at the uh, St. Pete Grand Prix that weekend and JG, our art director, he was, um, he was going to a big autocross that weekend. So we were like on our way, like he, his event still happened. The St. Pete Grand Prix didn't happen. Um, and then Tim and Margie Sutter, who owned the, the company, said, all right, we're all going to start working at home. We don't know what's going on. You know, this is all blowing up. Everyone go work at home, um, which for us is not so bad. It's not like we're a restaurant. Working at home, if you have a re in a restaurant, that would be tough. Yeah. Work, um, I was already working at home one day a week. Um, JG was working at home two days a week. Um, Sarah, who copy edits everything you see and pastes up most of what you see, She's been telecommuting for like a dozen years. So we were already in this, we're, we could always already work remote. I already had my, the office I'm in, I've already, you know, this has been my office since we bought this house. So we were lucky that we already were used to that. And then modern technology stuff like Dropbox, Teams, um, we had just upgraded our photo server, which made it easier to access remotely. We had literally just done that. Again, timing. We had just, and it was like a free software upgrade. Total game changer. So the working at home part wasn't so bad. The event part, and we're also in the event business. We hold, we hold some right. events. We do our $2,000 challenge, ultimate track car challenge. Um, ultimate track car, we had a – that we canceled. Um, I think we canceled. I should remember all this better. $2,000 <laughs> challenge we dealt with. I guess what I'm saying, it, it affected us, but not as much as we thought we it would. Because we, we don't do a ton of event coverage, but we go to a lot of events. We still do a lot of stuff. So on one hand, it messed us up, but we just rolled with it. Like it didn't, you know, there were no blank pages. Um, we were still able to go to the track and test. Our local, the firm, uh, Florida International yeah. Rally Motorsports Park, local to us, we could still go there and test and do stuff. So we had no trouble, let's call it generating editorial, but at the same time, you had all these people who are now home and they were hungry for even more content. So mm -hmm. our web stuff, we had totally had a ramp up. Never mind, we had just hired a new video, Chris, our new video guy, and Colin was new in our web department. So we got a green team and a, you know we're playing under, who knows if the world's gonna end conditions. And we got people who want more content. 
but we have a really good team and we just kept, you know, kept traffic going up, kept everyone happy, you know, kept the customers happy and kept us generating editorial. Cause as we found everyone just kind of went in their garages and started working on stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the COVID was, we, it was, you know, I went to journalism school. My major was magazines. And I'll be honest, that was something we never, uh, that never came up in class was how to deal with running a pub or a company a during pandemic. a national pandemic. I yeah. must have missed that. I must have missed that day or something. Well, it gives you hung you over the night before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it gives you good opportunity, David. You can go back and teach this newly developed class with a whole new set of curriculum. I know. You know, it's funny. I actually, just before all this blew up, I was invited by a good friend of mine to be a pro in residence back at UG, at University of Georgia. He said, hey, you want to be a pro in residence? I said, sure. And then I said, what, is, what did I just say yes to? Because I have no <laughs> idea what that even means. Like, I don't know any, I don't know any of these terms. I've never even heard this term before. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, does this mean like you're going to kill me? Like, what does this mean? He goes, I don't know. It means you come back and you'll spend a few days working with the students. You'll meet with faculty. I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. And it took about a year for us to get to line the stars line up. And I did it when I went to um, Road Atlanta for Petit Le Mans. So this would have been end of 19. Mm -hmm. So I did Petit Le Mans and then I was a pro in residence. So I, you know, I wore a jacket and um, <laughs> stood before class. I, I think we had, I was there for like two or three days and I think I had like five classes and it was cool. And we just discussed all the real world stuff of, of you know, working in the field and um, met with the Dean and met with, you know, a bunch of people and uh, it was cool. So yeah, I don't know if that's a future, but it was um, it was cool being on the other side. I'm like, I used to sit in that same seat where you're sitting, dude. Yeah, and they're like, oh, it's just some fat old dude talking to me. Yeah, like, this is cool. <laughs> well, I I think that it's hard because as maybe this is me as um, you know, I I, I tend to gravitate towards a lot of gratitude, especially when I start to look at maybe where I am or mm -hmm. where I'm yeah. going or, or kind of the state of, you know, kind of affairs. Right. Um, yeah. and for me, I think the most, um, the best way to show that gratitude is through education, like yeah. pure, like unrestricted, uncommercialized, well, 98% uncommercialized, yeah. um, you know, content that allows people to grow their knowledge base to continue to stimulate yeah. our community and our industry. And that's what grassroots is really built on. And that, I mean, thank you. And that's what we try to do is um, we have, we came up with, the short answer is several years ago, we came up with a, a, a slogan, like a mission statement, I guess you'd call it, Yeah. which sounds so corporate BS. It was part of this retreat and we all didn't want to go. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing ever. And we had to come up with a mission statement and we came up with one, um, we're your personal guide to the sports car world. And that's what we are, is if you want to learn how to help, I got to know what kind of clutch to put in my Mustang. Okay, we're your personal guide to the sports car world. We'll help you figure out what clutch or what setup or what turbo to put on your DSM or you know, what wheels or how to know if these wheels are still good or what tires to get. So the education is fun. It's what we do. We're lucky to know a lot of people. And I admit, I don't know all the answers. I know some, I don't know all of them, but I'm lucky having done this for so long to know people who are way smarter than me. So if I have a wheel question, we know you guys yeah. or a tire question. I know a bunch of tire engineers, you know, like and people who know our world or tuning or this or that. So it's like, all right, you have a question about whatever race, to, uh, you know, tires. Well, let me get, let me introduce you to our friend here, but this it will teach us. We'll, you know, learn me, we'll learn us about tires or Miatas or whatever. And that's what we kind of do is kind of the education thing. So thanks for noticing that is kind of our, um, you know, yeah. Uh, what is it? Who, who said that? You'll know this from Long Island. An educated consumer is our best customer. That is someone's. That was a commercial growing up, like like for like a fur, like a furrier. Or something. It's a farce. Or, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. But um, and that's part of what we do. And, and we're yeah. curious too. Like I like to learn about. You know, it's cool when you buy a new car that you've never had before because now you learn about you know, what makes a Porsche tick or a BMW or whatever. Um, 
we just live in one of the greatest technologically um, accessible periods that there has ever been right now. Oh, yeah. And it's going to become more abundant. But the fact is, you know, we started out on this mission two years ago now because you were here in the beginning. Yes. Roughly. Yep. About yep. two years ago, we started out in this mission and we knew – Listen, there's no secret. The way of the world now is content. You got to put out content, right. even when you're not a media company. Even yeah. companies like us, we have to develop content. So we may, we said, well, what can we put out there? I mean, how many times can you say, hey, check out our wheel? And yeah. you know, one of the major benefits that we had was we said. We can we have relationships all over the place. Like we yeah. have forty years of relationships and people that we know and other companies that we have connection with. And we said, let's just start making educational stuff. Let's yeah. let's allow people to find our brand as another connection uh, to learn and stimulate the community that we. Are based right. in, Cause, and because you, someone who's into your wheels or our magazine, yeah, probably has a lot of common interests, right? They probably yeah. have cool tires. They want to know about shock absorbers. They want to know about Miatas or going to Radwood or That's all right. the stuff we've discussed. So it's not like all of a sudden we're going to start talking about horse feed, right? Or right, right? or or I don't know, you know, wall paint. I'm looking, I'm looking for an idea, you know, typewriters, <laughs> um, right? So. There is, you know, common things that people from our world are into. And, and you know, we have an off-topic uh, forum on our message board. And I love seeing those people discuss stuff because it's a similar – they'll take a similar approach to something that's not even about cars. Like someone will say, oh, wow, yeah, hey, I'm, uh, we, get, we need to buy a roof. What do I want? And someone will be like, oh, hey, I'm a roofer in real life. Now, you know, right. we always thought this was a, a, you know, a Honda guy. But, oh, no, I own a roofing company. Or, or they'll discuss like, you know, um, cast iron cookware or, you know, dealing with aging parents or, you know, you name it. I mean, the only thing, you know, we say, you know, no religion, no, no politics. Right. But Fair. everything else the, and everything else they'll talk about, like literally like depression or, hey, you know, a family member with alcoholism or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they will still use the same problem solving that they and same conversation that they were discussing on the main forum talking about. Miata shock absorbers or wheels or right. whatever. And they're shows, from the same community. It shows you that when you're car people, you share this common bond. Oh, yeah. And that bond can lead to some really interesting and fulfilling relationships, just knowing that you have that starting base point. Yes. And, and again, this is part of looking back, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty looking back at relationships and, and good friends in the industry who I've met through cars. Yeah. But then it's like, Oh yeah, we, we met each other because we went to cars, but we became really good friends because we're both into B vintage BMX or we're into punk rock or, or guitars or whatever. And that's what makes it more special when, you know, we'll talk, you know, and it's not about cars. We have, it's just, we're into the same bikes or whatever. Yeah. Or us, you know, Long Island stories, right? Sure. Like, because a lot of people know that's where I'm, I'm, you can't tell, but that's where I'm from. Um, that's when it becomes another, like, more satisfying, more complete. Because I'll be honest, I don't want to talk about, you know, shock absorbers and tires all day. Right. Yeah. No, it's, listen, it's completely valid. I just yeah. think that, you know, listen, if you have some sort of knowledge base, if you have oh, yeah. some sort of skill set, you know what the best thing you can do with your time? Put that information out there. It's yeah. going to help a couple of reasons. First thing is, <clears throat> you know, I think about a guy like me, uh, you know, self-teaching TIG welding because uh, I've done it plenty, never gotten really good at it. Yeah. And so now I'm on a mission that I've given myself every day I practice. Not always for a long time, but until right. – I get this thing down. I'm on this mission, right? And my whole thing is I can go to the internet and thousands of 
talented tradesmen that have right. learned welding for decades are right. there giving you these tips that should help fast pace this learning curve. I can do that with wheels. I right. can do that with cars to a reasonable extent uh, based off of my experience. I can do that with fabrication to a certain extent. But I can bring on Jason Whitfield of Whitfield Manufacturing who can tell you all the things about fabrication. I can bring on Brian right. Goodwin from Goodwin Racing who could tell you all about Miatas. I can bring on uh, Lawson from AEM who yeah, could tell yeah. you <clears throat> that's the gift that we've been given and we're – yeah. In such a good place that we have a company that supports this industry so much that they let us take time out of our day to do things that have nothing to do with wheels. That's cool. And that is part, I mean, you're right. And part of it, if you say, God, I don't want to say we're the elder statesmen, but we're the people who know a lot of these people. And yeah. it is cool to pass on this knowledge because, you know, we're not going to be here forever. Right. Um, and there is like, Every day I still learn stuff about our world. Like oh, you can't too. know everything about, you know, whatever, even wheels. I mean, you know, you're yeah. always learning about, and that's just one small part of our world or tires. I mean, mm -hmm. there, you know, you, there are some people who know everything, but not many. <laughs> and it is kind of rewarding to pass that on, whether it's through, you know, for us, it could be through the written word. It could be through digital video, you know, we do a lot of video stuff. Um, and it, it is fun to see people learn something. And, and granted, I like learning. You know, um, I didn't start playing guitar until very late, and it's fun learning new stuff. And it's like, oh, I learned, I learned something today. I learned, you know, look, I can almost play the song. It doesn't yeah. sound good, but I can almost play it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's like we recently just started doing this whole project together, where we had talked about, well, what can we do? And we said, oh, we'll put some videos out. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, look, the only stipulation is I want it to be about subjects. You know, wheel, wheel, for us, wheel and tire related. That's that's our wheelhouse, no pun intended. We should stay <laughs> yeah. there. But uh, so we started doing these things where we're going to premiere them on, on you know, with yeah. GRM because we're just going to put more information out into the space. Right. And that's a lot of it. I mean, and there's a ton of info out there, and not all of it's good. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is that's true. You know, who's, tell, who's telling you, you know, I can make a video saying, oh, make your wheels out of clay, right? You know, no, yeah. no or paper mache, or, or, or uh, you know, no, that's probably not the hot setup. So you do <laughs> want to always, you know, again, look at the source. Was That goes back to journalism school, is, you know, who was the source for this info? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it it is rewarding, and like I said, and again, going full circle, it was cool going back and doing it in a more um, formal setting. For, yeah, formal doing it in school. Yeah, because I never thought I would, you know, be standing in front of a class, and and I was in front of some were, uh, you know, very small, and some were like full on lecture room. You know, a couple, yeah. I don't know how many, couple, maybe two hundred kids in like a an auditorium. Yeah, and in fact, I think I had a class in one of that the same auditorium. Man. Um, like a history class. It wasn't journalism. It was, I think it was like history or something. These yeah. were, but it was cool. It's like, wow, I used to be one of those, like literally I was like, I sat up there and didn't pay attention. Um, this is I like should... the equivalent of today <laughs> writing a book because yeah. you wanted to write a book. Oh yeah. You know and, what I mean? And yeah. Well, that's the thing. When you were in school, you had to write because you know you needed the grade, right? You have right. to write this paper about whatever because you get a grade. Like, now you right, do it for do a paycheck, <laughs> right? If I do it good enough, I'll get a B. Um, now you do it for a, a paycheck. Um, you know, my other little hobby, which I need to get back to, is I, I, I do zines, okay. which you know, like little, which you know, like little magazines, which I love that world because it's all these people writing for the joy of writing. Like, I'll never make money on it. I, I gave myself and I gave myself an annual budget which actually was equal to a set of race tires for a year. Like, what would I spend? You know, what would I spend for a set of tires? All right, a grand, right? Round number. All right, I'll spend a grand, and I'm going to write and publish this scene. I'm going to get it printed and learn Photoshop, and, and I got it in different stores around the country, and, and I sell some, and I make some money. And my wife's an accountant, and jokingly, I'm like, oh, can I deduct this? And she's like, no. <laughs> All right. I'm like, um, but it was a fun 
you know, and I'd go to some zine conventions and, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm the, I'm the old fat guy there, but it was cool seeing people who were in so into writing these zines, yeah. writing these stories and maybe they'd sell a few, maybe, but it was the, it was the pure joy of doing something where back in the day you wrote because you had to. Yeah. No, it's, it's a hundred percent valid. And I think, yeah. I think, you know, doing what you love turns out a better product. I think oh, yeah. being able to take uh, satisfaction and gratification in oh, yeah. turning out stuff that maybe you have fought to acquire, but now you can hand it to somebody, I think is yeah. also uh, fairly rewarding as well. Totally. It's a, I mean, and we try to do that with the magazine. I mean, we're all here because we're car people. I mean, I was always in the cars. Yeah. Um, you know, grew up reading my dad's uh, sports car graphics. We had them on the basement. So, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, do this. So it's not like, oh, really, I want to go write about horses or, you know, whatever. It's like, no, like I, you know, again, I always wanted a Miata, you know, once I saw what a Miata was or an MG or whatever. Yeah. So for us and everyone at staff, we were all readers before we worked there. Yeah. I was a reader. I was a, a reader before meeting Tim and JG. So, um, we're here because we love it. I mean, that's why we work. I don't know how many hours I work. Don't ask me. It's not. It's not a forty-hour-a-week job. I'll tell of course. You that. Mm. Well, you know, and you know, and that's the thing. Like, if anybody thinks you're going to work in automotive and get rich, this is not that industry. No, I mean, and it also means like I may wake up at two in the morning, and be like oh, I got an idea. Right. I got to go write it down before I forget it. So I'll come, right. like, literally, I was at my computer the other night, or I don't know if it was night or morning. It was three. In, it was three a.m. I'm not sure what that counts as writing because i kind of had done an interview had an idea woke up and i knew i would if i fell back to sleep i would lose it and if i didn't write it down i wouldn't be able to fall asleep mm. so i'm like all right let me come down here and start writing it and talk about a conundrum so i went to bed at i went back up it was 5 30 which is funny that's when my wife gets up so we've done that a few times like a tag team like, oh, i'm going to bed i'm getting up i should you know you know, as soon as I got into bed, I heard the dog wake up and my wife get up. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, I'm going to sleep. You're starting your day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it is, you know, I get, we get a lot of people who we use the term, they want to wear the shirt, right? They want to wear the Koenig shirt, the grassroots shirt, which is good, but it is, a, it's a, you know, it's a lot of work. You know, I joke, I want to be an Iron Maiden. I would love to play guitar for Iron Maiden <laughs> or bass. <laughs> ask me how many iron maiden songs i know i've yeah. learned over you know i've learned part of one yeah <laughs> and ask me how much i practice this week yeah not a lot you know like <laughs> I'll, i i have lessons every week and i'll email my teacher he owns the local shop and he knows my gig he you know he, i have a career and i'll be like hey like i didn't do my homework this week in fact i actually emailed him this morning i said by the way i didn't do my homework you know what my homework was for this week listen to Judas Priest and figure out which Judas Priest song we want to learn next. And I didn't even do that. <laughs> like, I didn't even listen. Like, I'm not saying learn the song. I didn't even pick out what song to do next because I was so busy. And he's like, yeah, it's fine. You know, so it's like, but if I was serious, I would have, you know. Yeah. He's a real good musician. He would he can learn a Judas Priest song from nothing in 10 minutes. Yeah. Me, it'll take me two weeks just to pick out one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the commitment if you're serious yeah you know you'll really do the work so we know where i am how serious i'm about playing guitar yeah mm -hmm. but the magazine that's different or the websites that's different yeah these brands they they become part of us and you know what's yeah. interesting is like you know i do cruise through the comments and and we all do and yeah. um i think that it's real easy for people to look at companies as companies, but right. there's some companies like us where we're majority car people and yeah. every design hit or miss is something that we put out because we developed it. We liked it and right. you know, or, or somebody liked it because not everybody's gonna have the same flavor, right? Um, the ice cream flavor. Yeah. yeah right. But, it's one of those things. I think that it's really important that people, you know, understand that like some people do this strictly for the love of this and they love being able to give things to other car enthusiasts. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you see, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at people who work corners as CCA workers, they don't get paid to stand up there and wave flags. Right. But they enjoy it. And right. 
that is part of our world or, yeah. or, you know, I, I, I'm chairperson of the British Motor Trade Association. That's of one of my other are. hats. Of course I am. And we always joke like, <laughs> all right, this year board, we're going to double our salary yeah. because, you know, we get paid zero. Right? right. But we do it because we believe in the industry and, 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 and whatever. So, you know, I do it because I, yeah, I guess we like it. And, and, um, I guess we like it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> said with so and, much enthusiasm. And, 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 yeah, exactly. And it's cool working <laughs> with cars versus other stuff. I wouldn't be this passionate working on a furniture magazine or a. I could never do man. this for a lot of other products. Oh, I know. It'd be hard. I, I really couldn't with the amount of time and effort it takes to do yeah. what we do here. If it wasn't car related, right. I don't think. I could be so involved in it. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, yeah. I'm here because yeah. I'm not at the drive anymore. So right. it's like, yeah, I, I could have, you know, started working at Starbucks or whatever, but I wanted a really good opportunity <laughs> to, you know, it's like, no, not, not Starbucks, not on no, Starbucks. No. Right. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, like you have, it is, it is work. That's why they call it work. Of course. Right. right. And it's a little bit like, it is your job, good or bad. So sometimes like, I don't yeah, want to talk about cars. Like I'll go, you know, um, see some friends at a local event and I just want to hang out with them. And they know I don't want to talk about cars. And one of my buddies, he'll run interference. Like he'll see someone wanted to talk to me. And he'll like drag me away. He's like, no, dude, that, that, that guy wanted to talk to you about getting his car in the magazine. It is Sunday. You need to rest. We're just going to go over here. I'm going to chat about music or, or skateboards or, or whatever. So who's your and, friend and can we hire him to hang out yeah, with me? Exactly. <laughs> um, maybe. Um, no, uh, he's got a gig too, but he doesn't live near you. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's, and that's part of it. It is, um, yeah, sometimes be careful what you wish for. I, I, you know, I used to think I went, again, going back to Iron Maiden, I thought I went, you know, you, you always think you want to be in a rock band. And um, a buddy of mine is in a, a metal band that's a touring I mean, I pay to see them. I mean, they're they're big, right? And this is several years ago. They were playing in 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 Tampa, and he's like, "Hey, dude, you coming?" I'm like, "Of course, I'm coming." Um, all right, get here earlier, and we'll go to dinner. Oh, cool, right? Uh, so, hey, where are you? Meet me. Go around the corner from the venue. You'll see our tour bus. Can't miss it. Go around the corner. There's our tour bus, and there he is. Like, hey, there he is. There's the bassist. There's my, my buddy. Hey, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Hey, you want to see inside the tour bus? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. Right. Big coach bus, right? picture your typical rock and roll tour bus and the front of it was the little area in the front had like rock clothes like the vest that the lead singer wears was hanging on a hanger right and my buddy's not the bass he plays on stage but his like bus Practice bass was sitting there yeah. right like his other bass his b bass was there i get to play and he goes hey let me show you the rest and he pulls the curtain aside and there's 16 bunks for 15 dudes because the other, the opening band was with them, and the crew was with them, and that's when I went, I don't want to be in a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, that reminds me of like, and then we'll let you go. But like that's that fine. reminds me of like the days where we used to do all the Nopey tours and oh, yeah. all the. Oh. I mean, people would be like, "Oh, you mean you get to drive and do?" It. Listen, for the first two, three, four years, yeah. <laughs> Really great experience. Yeah, you know? I know. Yeah, when you yeah. get to year seven, eight, nine, you know, whatever, all of a sudden go into the same crappy hotels oh. and <laughs> this meals and answering the same questions on repeat and getting up and knowing that after you drive, you know, 14 hours home, right. you got to go right into the office and start working on something yeah. else. It's um, it's wearing. You know, but it could be, you know, it could be worse, right? Yes. It could be, it could, it could, it could could be, be a rain. paper convention. It could be a paper. And you know what? Like we get, so real quick, this is a million years ago. Um, whenever we switch, and this is just for print, whenever we would switch paper, stock, size, whatever, our printer would send us samples of other magazines on those paper stocks, yep. right? Because there's a million kinds of paper stocks, of course. right? Yeah. And he would send us, you know, like, here's ones on that same paper. And one of them was like an animal husbandry magazine. <laughs> One of them was a parking lot management magazine, right? And and one of them was like a uh, something in the construction industry, but it was very it was like very specialized construction. And I'm heavy, like heavy hitting stuff, here. right? And I'm like, hey, this is what we could be doing. We could be writing about parking lot management. So let's count our blessings, right? Instead, we're writing about Honda CRXs and Miatas. Yeah. We're not doing a comparison of those little bumpers in the parking lot, so you don't pull too far and hit the car in front of you. <laughs> Cause that's what was in this magazine. Oh and um, 
so again, I mean, yeah, it's like how do you even come up with content for that? Is it stripes or no stripes? I, you know, you know? I, <laughs> I'm looking. I, I'm I'm bad about throwing stuff away. I probably still have them, and this is from like 15 or 20 years ago. And then when I told him, I thought it was funny. He's like, "Oh, let me send you some more." And it was like some magazines for like oil and gas drilling, and and just all these like totally. I'm like, God, I'm so happy I'm writing about CRXs and Miatas mm-hmm. and not like how to dig a better ditch because, yeah. you know, well, I'm really I, good I, at yeah. digging ditches. I, I, then I'd go work <laughs> at Starbucks. So um, yeah. it is fun. And, and again, like I, 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 on one hand, like I always caution people when they say they want to work in the industry, but it can be the best. I've met so many uh, great, amazing people. I made so many great friends. My wife jokes whenever I meet someone, like run into someone at the track or whatever, and then we walk away. I always say to my wife, "Oh, I've no, known him twenty five years," and she goes, "It's always twenty five years." I'm like, "I know, because I'm old, right?" Mm-hmm. And you realize some of these people, it's like, "Wow, we've been dealing with some of these dudes, yeah, twenty five, thirty years now, longer." And it's kind of, I want to, that's kind of, that's really cool, yeah. And uh, you know, it's, it's humbling. Um, Actually, here, I'll, I'll name drop, and I didn't do anything. I was at our <laughs> local supermarket down the street. Yeah, last night, I had to pick up some stuff I wanted to get for lunch. And you know, we're all masks, so you, you don't recognize anyone. And I'm like, that guy looks familiar. Was it Rutledge? And then, and, then, and then he pulled down his mask to like eat in the supermarket, which I don't know if you're supposed to do. It was it was Mike Helton, who's like was like president of NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. And I almost said, like, oh, I and now I think I have his signature on uh, a form that I did something at a – I did some land speed record at Talladega a million years ago. And I think he's the auto the signature on it. And I almost wanted to say something, but I'm like, God, that is so silly. I'm like, this poor dude just wants to like buy some frozen pizzas. And, <laughs> and this was, Dave. this was yesterday. Oh, oh, it's my camera. battery died. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, uh, podcast is almost over. <laughs> <laughs> David, what? I think we're going to wrap it up because that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. I appreciate you being a sport. If it wouldn't end uh, with a technical difficulty, I wouldn't know how else to do it. Oh, exactly. (sighs) Yeah. I could have brought in another battery. It's all right. (laughs) Thanks very much. Um, Yeah. I appreciate it. It's been good. It's been good talking with you. It's always good talking with you. Same here. Thank you. And, uh, Oh, yeah, I'm not, I got to my guitar teacher, so maybe it's good that I didn't practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you, and uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll catch up with you real soon. Cool. I'm always here for you guys. Thank you so All much right, for David, having me. All right, David. Thanks. Have a good day. See you. Thanks, you too. All right, bye. Well, you can't see us. Oh, Luis ended it. <laughs> Wait, with audio? I don't know. He just ended it. 